So I want you to, to conjure in your minds the following, okay? So it's a wet morning. Transportation has ground to a halt because of a strike. So far, you actually don't need to imagine too hard at all. But into this predictable scenario, I want you to place yourself in the mindset of a 13-year-old who is starting their first day at a new school 60 miles away. What do you do? Do you set out for school or do you not? I should add, and this is probably going to make your decision-making process a whole lot easier, your parents are not with you. So no cajoling, no guilt, at least initially. What do you do? In 1926, when 13-year-old Alan Turing faced this exact dilemma on his first day at Sherborne School, he decided to cycle the 60 miles from Southampton to here. And this was after he traveled for about 11 hours from San Marle. I wonder how his action compares with what you have just decided to do. <laughs> and in posing this second question, I, I'm not judging, I'm truly, truly not. But as a teacher, I believe that defining characteristics become evident at a young age, even if they need later honing and nurturing. And I think this episode does much to demonstrate Turing's defining characteristics, his determination, his focus. And I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to suggest that in this vignette, we can glimpse those qualities, those skills, that would contribute to two of his greatest professional achievements. First, his code-breaking work for Bletchley Park during the Second World War, where he worked to crack Germany's Enigma machine, and according to some estimates, helped to bring that conflict to a swifter conclusion, saving the lives of thousands. Or second, his pioneering work in computer science that today enables us to communicate with anyone, anywhere, at any time. For this feat, Turing is hailed as the father of modern computing. And yet, and yet, if we were to think about our initial responses to Turing's trek, we would probably conclude that it was really, really unusual. For a boy on the precipice of the terrible teens to make the snap decision to cycle 60 miles through a largely unfamiliar region alone, for him to have the foresight to have his luggage sent on ahead to school, for him to have done any one of these things, let alone all, I'm guessing would be every parent's dream. <laughs> but it's frankly unusual, it's odd. And I'm guessing it's not what the majority of us would have done. And so Turing's heroic trek demonstrates, I think, another of his defining characteristics, his uniqueness, or what many of his peers, even close relatives, would regard less favorably as his marginality. And marginality is what I want to ponder with you over the next few moments. And by marginality, I'm not primarily thinking about people's beliefs, their ethnicity, gender, or sexuality. Although, of course, we know these are all reasons why people come to be ostracized and forced to live at the periphery of their communities. Here, I'm primarily thinking about the marginality precipitated by a person's character and personality, by the things they think, say, and do that are innate, but which can be misunderstood criticized and consequently rejected by those around them. And Turing, our solo cyclist, certainly was marginal. He was academically confident, even precocious, socially awkward, sometimes to the point of brusqueness. And as that cycling episode demonstrates, he was, he was single-minded. He was also homosexual at a time when it was illegal to be so. 
And although I said I wouldn't dwell on the issue of sexuality, I think Turing's homosexuality really was inherent to his character. It helps to explain, I think, why throughout much of his life he was misunderstood, and why even his brother would describe him as an eccentric of outsize proportion. One episode that I think demonstrates Turing's uniqueness and the cause of his marginality occurred in 1952. Turing was living in Manchester, working in the university's mathematics department on what would become the earliest computers. Or at least this was until he was arrested for gross indecency, for having sex with another man in the privacy of his home. Found guilty, Turing was presented with two, <laughs> two options. I kind of can't call them choices. To go to prison or to be chemically castrated. Now, had I been alive in 1952, it's conceivable that as a gay man, I would have faced the same decision. And I've thought, I've thought a lot about what I would have done. And probably, I think, I'd have chosen prison, believing that to be the, the easier option. But Turing did not. He chose chemical castration. The repeated injection of female hormones would ostensibly cure him of his homosexuality. What it most certainly did do was to destroy his physical health and undermine his psychological well-being. Two years after his sentencing and two weeks before his 42nd birthday, Turing killed himself, biting into a poison-laced apple. But times change. In 2009, the British government issued a posthumous apology for the appalling treatment that Turing had endured as a consequence of his homosexuality. And in February of this year, the British, I'm sorry, the BBC proclaimed Turing their icon of the 20th century, largely on account of his work in computer science. It seems to me that we've long benefited from what Turing did. But only now, 50 years after he took his life, do we seem inclined to want to consider him for who he was. And I think it's taken this long, too long, for us to do this because Turing was marginalized. Contemporaries saw the oddities before the opportunities, the unusual over the unique. And more tragically, I think, they recoiled rather than seeking to reassure and hesitated before providing help. But Turing's cycle ride, if we go back to that, demonstrates, I think, that the weird and the wizard are not separable elements of his character. The cause of his marginality was also the source of his magnificence. And the more I thought about the tragedy, even cynicism, of Turing's posthumous appreciation, the more I came to realize how marginalized people can have a, a social impact that is positively disproportionate to their standing among their peers. The pernicious paradox whereby the cause of a person's marginality is simultaneously also the source of their magnificence is all too easy to evidence. And let me share another example. Let's think about the first photographer to have their work included in the Venice Biennale. A photographer whose 1972 retrospective at MoMA, New York's Museum of Modern Art, is still one of their highest attended exhibitions nearly five decades later. A short, wild-eyed woman called Diane Arbus. 
Arbus was someone who suffered from depression throughout her life, and her work is rooted in her sense of displacement and marginality. Famously, she wanted to normalize the marginalized. Her portraits include photographs of freaks, as she called them, amputees, dwarves, transgender, who would not conventionally be regarded as beautiful. To Arbus, they were. These people, these unusual subjects, seem to have been whom she was looking for to provide solace for herself. But even this was not sufficient. At the age of 48, Arbus committed suicide, taking barbiturates and slashing her wrists in the bath. Her tale is a tough one to hear, but it demonstrates, I think, that woman and work are not separable. Arbus's triumph was made possible by her tragedy. In their respective fields, Turing and Arbus are heavyweights, responsible for conceiving of and creating transformational shifts in the way that we think and feel, in the way that we live. They are also people who, for a time, and sadly too short a time, showed resilience in the face of their marginality to achieve magnificence. Unfortunately, as a teacher, I've encountered too many students whose brilliance was blunted, if not altogether blocked, by their marginality. A lack of empathy, sympathy, support did not galvanize them, it weakened them. It made it too difficult for them to be themselves, for them to realize that they had something to offer. The disproportionately positive impact that marginalized people can go on to have in their societies only heightens this tragedy. According to a personality profile devised by Mayers and Briggs and based on the work of psychoanalyst Carl Jung, there exist 16 universal character types. Alan Turing's profile is shared by 13% of the world's population, Arbus's by eight. It was, I suppose, with a certain sense of confirmation and concern when I realized that my profile is the rarest, <laughs> shared by fewer than 1% of the world's population, it is characterized, apparently, by a parity between sense and sensibility. Almost certainly, this explains why I'm standing on this red dot talking to you about marginality. Some of you may also be realizing that the sensibility bit explains what I'm wearing. <laughs> Unlike, Arbus and Turing, my magnificence is still very much awaited. <laughs> Although I'm pretty chuffed with the suit, frankly. Um, but like them, my sense of marginality became apparent when I was young. I remember at the age of 13, so the same age that Turing is cycling heroically to Sherborne, starting at a new school because of my father's work, and how difficult it was for me to forge friendships. And this exacerbated my inclination to analyze and to dwell on my feelings. And so I did what came naturally, and I studied. And that in turn developed my sense of empathy and my acute sensitivity to the feelings of others around me. And so I stood out even more. My marginality, became apparent at a young age just by being me. But now I realize that those characteristics are at the core of what I do as a teacher and cultural historian. That my marginality as I perceive it, and any potential that I have for magnificence beyond selecting my clothes in the morning, share the same source. 
So, what do we do to ensure that the margins and the middle are not irreparably separated? Well, as much as we may regret the early deaths of Arbus and Turing, we need to acknowledge that the marginalized who continue to live among us, unheralded and unsupported, with their enormous potential unrealized, constitutes a wicked waste of life. We need to acknowledge that it is simply too convenient to dismiss people as oddities and thereby absolve ourselves of the responsibility to understand and to support them. And we need to re-engage with each other and not rely on the distorting oculus of social media through which anyone can appear an infallible icon. And we know, we know of the very important work that is done by charities like Mind and the Samaritans and the socially-minded lessons that take place in schools. But I'm thinking about us and what we can do. And I want us to talk. I guarantee right now, and maybe I'm going back to judging here, I guarantee right now we all have someone in our lives whom we tend to avoid, whom we've marginalized to some degree. We might have a reason for this. Probably we only think we do. In the next 24 hours, I'd like you to challenge yourselves to reach out to that individual, to seek to understand their value and to embrace their otherness. And who knows? They may go on to make as big a difference as Turing and Arbus, and you would have played your small part in their story. The 13-year-old you may have responded to torrential rain and transport delays by hunkering down in bed. But praise the pluck and seek to understand the audacity of those 13-year-olds who cycle. And if you were one of those 13-year-olds who, like Alan Turing, would have cycled, never Never let that difference make you feel unworthy. Because you, like him, are navigating your own path, however difficult. And that is where marginality truly, truly becomes magnificent. Thank you.